one of the University of Transport Center, our one from the articles in the international numbers and the year review conference of positive is the ASCP experience in the seven different We received a lot at the National Science Foundation, the NSF sponsors. Part American Aerobans Road Institute on the Fortunate Urban Crisis. Here also won the MIT Talent Boosters Award on the Discrete Choice Model. He has received the Outstanding Ecology Research Award at the University of Mexico. He is a registered professional engineer at the PE in the state of Michigan. His expertise includes transport demand modeling, transportation planning and policy, econometrics modeling, transportation economics and the finance. He also involved with a number of national and the state transportation works from the Federal Highway Administration, Census with the Department of the Transportation. He also the one of the principal developers of the developers of the Maryland, Maryland statewide transportation model. <clears throat> he has led the statewide land use model development research of the state of Maryland. In addition to this planning for the travel demand modeling, he also worked on a number of projects on the modeling by transportation, transportation and safety. He is in the review panel of transportation research of part A, C, D, E, and F of the ASC transportation research board. ERP, also complete for environment and the urban system health sphere, research in the transportation economic health sphere, journal of urban <coughs> management and the urban strategies. Dr. Mishra is the member of the transportation economics committee, which AB20 and the Freight Economic and Regulation Committee AG8010 of the National Academy of Science and GRB. So I request you start to study. All right. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah. So we're going to do the presentation first, right? So let me plug in my USB, and then from that I'll begin my presentation. And after that we'll have a, a whatever time you need for a questions and, and answers. So we'll go by that. Or type of discussion. Anything you like. You know, this is a very friendly environment. So please yeah. calm down. Don't have any nervousness or anything like that. So. And again, the topic that I will be talking about is something that everybody can understand. So, so give us about two, three minutes for me to plug in my USB drive here, and we'll be too ready. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, so <clears throat> today's discussion is about smart and connected cities. Cities are something that we really build. That's where we spend most of our time. Um, a city can be as small as a few hundred people to a city can be as big as almost a million residents. So, the concept of smart and connected cities have been getting attention in the last few years. Though the concept of smart city is not uh, extremely old or extremely new, it has been a word that was coined by some urban planners in about 1960s. And we see smart cities getting attention everywhere in the world. India has a published rank of 100 smart cities in India. So how our example of of our current cities, how are they different <coughs> compared to how, what, what we call as smart cities? So a conventional city and a smart city, how they're different. So the difference comes in uh, what we call as adoption of technologies. The, there are a number of technologies which are not present in conventional cities, can be found in smart and connected cities. So what those technologies are, and what smart cities are. This is an overview of a presentation. Of course, the goal is not to become an expert in smart city, but rather to have, to get an overview of where we are and where we are going forward. So, with the um, outline of my presentation, I'm going to talk about what is the definition of a smart city? How do we define it? Then, what are some of the technological challenges that we see in smart cities? Then I'm going to talk about what is the United States experience of smart cities in terms of four specific areas that I'm going to talk about. The first one is urban automation. The second one is connected vehicle environments. The third one is ICTs, okay? information and communication technologies. What are the challenges there? And the last one that I'm going to talk about is logistics and supply chains and, and urban deliveries. So there are a number of challenges, but I'm going to talk focus on these four because of time constraints today. Um, then I'm going to talk about what is the path ahead. And most of my discussion is based on US experience. So uh, in which way US has, has embraced the concept of smart cities. So how do we define smart city? As you see on the screen, so smart city is a city that connects human beings and it connects social capital and also ICTs. So ICTs, as I said, it's information and communication technologies. It has its own infrastructure. So ICTs are not only specific or unique to any specific technology, but ICTs can be water, can be energy, can be transportation, can be electrical, 
can be information. Uh, so these are the facets or various types of branches of smart cities and everything must be connected together seamlessly for a city to function properly. That's what we call as a smart city. So my apologies for, for the very small diagram there. You see there is smart water, energy, transportation, healthcare. Uh, there is emergency, education, management, and buildings. Okay, so there are a lot of components are there in smart city. So for example, if we have a smart city and we don't uh, see electricity being available 24 seven, then it's, it's 24 hours a day and seven days a week, then we should not be calling it a smart city. Similarly, water not being available. So in those cases also, we cannot call this a smart city. Um, energy efficient, the buildings must be energy efficient. Meaning, for example, for some reason there are, there are calamities or that for some reason we do not get electricity for some time, then our building should perform as usual. So there are a number of facets or components of smart city. What I'm going to talk about today, this is a gigantic system. I'm not going to talk about everything. I'm going to talk about the third pillar from this set of pillars, which is smart transportation. That's what I'm going to talk about. So this is a slide that really differentiates between two different types of cities. One we call as a sustainable city, which has been in existence for many, many years. But now we are calling it sustainable and smart cities. So in which way these two figures are different? If you see the left hand side of your figure, then we see there are sustainable cities. The right hand side of the figure is smart cities. So there are two, only three circles that you see, those are added. In, in, in addition to the sustainable cities are technological factors, human factors, and institutionalized factors. So again, my topic of discussion is going to be, again, further specific. I'm going to talk about only the technological factor, which is on the left hand side. That's where I'm going to focus into. So in terms of technologies, what do we see in terms of smart transportation? Transportation is something that all of us can relate, right? Whenever we, we wake up, we, we put our step you know, just outside, we are into the system of transportation. Either we walk, we take a bicycle, we take a taxi, we drive by ourselves. We are into the transportation system. So transportation system is pretty common to all of us. And we can relate how we behave in a transportation system, how a transportation system is reacting to our actions. We can relate. <laughs> so in terms of uh, technologies, what we see is that how many of you have heard there is something called as driverless cars? Many of you have heard that, right? So if you, and many of you have experienced what this uh, concept of Uber and, and other type of uh, ride-sharing uh, vehicles, right? So if you go to US about 20 cities right now, if you go to Uber has driverless cars, meaning you just hop into Uber, there is no driver. There may be a driver sitting just, just in case, but uh, many cities are operating right now in driverless cars. So we see that on top two sections, they're connected vehicles and vehicle automation. And there, is, there, there exists distinct differentiation between those two. Uh, then we have IoT, Internet of Things. Many of you, I have heard that you are from electrical or computer science background, some of you, so uh, you may relate to what is called as IoT. Machine learning is, is an algorithm where if we see some behaviors and that has been repeating time over and again, we can use machine learning principles to learn what has been happening. In addition to that, we see that with ICTs, we see everything is a big data. Any text message that you send, any call that you make is everything recorded somewhere. Similarly, if you have your cell phone on and you're, drive, you're, you're driving and you have your Google Maps on, then Google is collecting your data and those data is used in some way or the other. So we have plethora of information, big data available, which was not available before, say 20 years ago. We did not have such type of situation, but now we have it. So mobility on demand, meaning people would like to go from point A to point B, when, point A to point B, whenever they want, without having any type of restrictions. So that's what we see is, is mobility on demand. So a smart transportation system should have, uh, should have a platform that embraces such type of technological innovations. Uh, so what happens without this, without vehicle automation, without connected vehicles, a city would be a conventional city, would not be called as a smart city. 
So that's how a smart city would be different from a sustainable city. What are some of the challenges? And we see there are 12 challenges, 12 vision elements. And I'm going to talk about today, number one, two, six, and 11. Those are the four ones that I'm going to talk to talk about today. So vision element one is urban automation. What is urban automation? So urban automation meaning we see number of facets of an urban area are automated. Meaning what we see here, there's an initiative in the US called as Tours Zero Death. So what does that mean? So all of us might have heard, you know, it's unfortunate to hear that a person died because of a traffic accident, right? So there are three things can be responsible for such type of effects. Number one, that could be a vehicular fault. Number two, there could be a railway geometry fault or something associated with the environment. Third thing is could be a human behavior fault. A human behavior, the human was not driving, or the driver was not driving for it. So out of these three things, <coughs> what we call as three E's that, that we can always in transportation mitigate, two things are a little bit easier to control and one thing is very hard to control. One thing very hard to control is human behavior. We cannot control human behavior because everybody has their birthright or whatever they want to do, they can do. There's freedom in democratic countries. However, we can design a vehicle properly, we can design a roadways properly. So if we do those two things properly, and also we can have restriction on human behavior, meaning if you are in a car, you have to have your seatbelt on. Transportation engineers were trying to make sure that these things do not happen. So there is an initiative called as Towards Zero Death. That means we are embracing a time where we would not like anybody to have a single death because of transportation. So for that to happen, you see the first bullet is improving safety. So if we have a human being not driving a vehicle, that means what? We're eliminating the third part, is that human behavior is not involved in any type of decision making. So in that case, we will have much more control over human behavior and driving behavior. So increasing mobility and accessibility. So we can have, uh, we can have, uh, right now we're not allowing people, let's say of 70, 75 years or so more, we're not telling that you're good drivers. You should not be driving a car right now because you're too old to do that, right? So, in a vehicle where there is no driver needed, they can, they can drive, they can go from point A to point B. They do not need anybody's permission. They can just simply hop into a car and go from point A to point B. So that's, that, that is what is urban mobility is, is what we're looking into. Reducing energy and, uh, and emissions. So we are in a small area, so we know everything, right? If you have been asked, you know, in your family, your mother says that, go and get some vegetables, you know. Now imagine you are in a big city where you are not familiar with which of the routes where to go and what to do. And that's typically the case in big cities. Where I stay, I don't know all the roads. And I'm only familiar with some. But if I want to go from point A to point B, and if I know what is the best route to take, I will really depend on my vehicle to give me some guidance where to go. We can still use cell phones, but cell phones would be limited. They would be telling us, hey, use the shortest path. They can give us guidelines, but the vehicle, we can have, hey, I have multiple options. I can go the emission minimization route, meaning take me in such a route that my min emissions are going to be minimized, meaning how much greenhouse gas my car is emitting, give me the minimum value there. Or take me to the fastest possible route, wherever possible. Or give me a ride in such a way that I will enjoy the environment take me through jungles, take me through fields, greeneries, and so forth. So those are the things who have options in the vehicle. Right now, we don't have them, right? So that is urban automation. Greatest uh, benefits of autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles are 
Autonomous vehicles, what we mean is the dis differentiation between autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles. Autonomous vehicles meaning it's a vehicle that is autonomous by its own, meaning it can take its own decisions, whatever it likes. <coughs> However, a connected vehicle is that a connected vehicle can talk to other vehicles and also can talk to the roadway surfaces. You know, where is it going? At what should I, at what speed should I move so that when I reach a traffic signal, I will hit green all the time, right? So it's talking to the infrastructure rather. So a connected vehicle and autonomous vehicle, that's the difference between them. So you see that only you see Wi-Fi signs on autonomous vehicle, but in connected vehicles, there are Wi-Fi signs, but it can it can work on DSRC principles. I'm going to talk about what are what, what is DSRC just in a few minutes, after a few minutes. So right now, there are autonomous vehicles, there are levels of autonomy. There are five levels of autonomy of what we see. And level five being fully automated, meaning you can just simply sit, relax, close your eyes, and you'll be safe. Okay, your your vehicle is not going to you know get into any type of accident. Level one, two, three is something right now we see. They're in effect. They're in effect. So if you go to Volvo or General Motors or Ford, if you ask them, I would like to take a test ride of your of your autonomous vehicle, they will tell you there are a few features that you can see. And I'm, I, myself, I have I've driven that. So for example, if you're traveling and there is lane marking, right? So if for some reason you are drowsing, it's night and you're driving. For some reason you are getting off track of the road. So the vehicle is going to beep. So you know that, okay, I'm drowsing at this point. I should be coming back to the track. Other features, such as you're driving, there's a truck ahead of you, and you're speeding fast. At that point of time, the vehicle can easily sense that I have this much of a headway, meaning distance that I'm maintaining. I'm traveling at speed X. So it's a very simple principle of speed, uh, time, and, time and distance, right? So it's automatically going to reduce your speed so that you know you're not going to have a crash with the vehicle, crash with the truck ahead. Similarly, lateral clearance. You're trying to change a lane, and you have not seen that there is another person actually traveling just side to you because your mirror cannot capture that, right? Sine 45 equals to cos 45, right? If you can see if somebody is about 40 feet behind you, but somebody who is parallel to you who is moving parallelly as to you, as your rear lights, you cannot see that. That cannot be reflected in a mirror, not neither in the rear mirror, not in the side mirrors. So black spots, it identifies black spots. So we have those technologies, but we have not reached the level five. So these are some examples of level five. So look at level five on the extreme right hand side, what the driver is doing there. <laughs> Eyes closed, right? So that's what we're looking at. Right now we see level one was there a long time back. Level two, level three is there right now. Uber and Lyft, both of them are operating in 20 cities in the US. So that's what we're getting into, all right? So level four, we're not there yet, but they're, they're in test beds right now. And uh, many uh, test pilot test beds of all automotive companies, they're running pilots there. Even read books still, your alertness is needed. Five is no alertness, relax, okay? So that's how five autonomous levels are. So these are some examples of self-driving shuttles. This is uh, one example in CityMobile. There's a company. So uh, what they're doing is that uh, not only just one person, but multiple people can essentially enter into a vehicle and those are self-driving shuttles. So we're not looking into only self-driving cars where only two or three people can go. Self-driving shuttles can take even masses of people together. So. You see the, the vehicle lengths are not that like a bus, right? The reason being, they're operating in electrical power and they cannot take at this point of time about 75 people the way regular buses can take. So that's the difference. You see gateway system. This is one of the systems in UK um, where it's automated shuttles, but you see that you know those are like open taxi. Those were, if you're, if you're trying to visit London, for example, they can take you and have a ride around London. So, no. They do not operate on fixed guideways, right? Rail system, but still they have rubber tires, but they can do that as well. Uh, Volvo, for example, Volvo has a very nice car. Volvo is just given as an example. The auto manufacturers, they have already into this business like 10 years back. 
while as a student, I have seen back in 2005 and 6, General Motors and, and other companies have their test dates in Detroit, Michigan, when they would have a vehicle going, reaches to a traffic signal, an emergency vehicle comes, right? We need to give priority to the emergency vehicle at any point of time. The vehicle, essentially learning from an emergency vehicle, would stop. At the same time, the signal would change to rate to the direction of the emergency vehicle. So those technologies are not new right now. But we are seeing outside, it's available to public right now. So auto manufacturers are, are many, many steps ahead than what we see. Technical challenges. There are a number of challenges in urban auto automation. So the way it sounds very nice and dandy to ears, you know, it may have problems. So what do we see? You know, I'll take you back uh, about 200 years. So before, <laughs> we did not have buildings. We were living in jungles. Slowly, we started to have buildings. Now we have concrete buildings and we have multiple levels. So when we had multiple levels, how we were going? By ladder, by steps, by staircases. Imagine a time when we had lifts or elevators. A lot of people died because of that. Do we see any type of deaths because of elevators these days? It's history. Same thing. So we're looking into automation. So right now, we may see a lot of problems. And of course, the way it sounds nice, Autonomous vehicle, they will not be free of grasses. Of course, there will be something happening. For example, foggy days, snowy days, extreme hot conditions, heavy rain. How they're going to how they're going to perform? Google car has about what they're saying, hundred thousand miles they have run. Tesla is another company. They're not in India, but huge manufacturers back in the U.S. So they are doing a lot of pilots right now to uh, take care of the technical challenges institutionalization of challenges so you know uh, every country is is a agglomeration or mix of number of states right every state have their own, own rules and so forth so we need to have specific challenges for example two states which are who are neighbors to each other for a connected vehicle or an auto, auto, automated vehicle to perform the roadway conditions has to be excellent meaning there has to be perfect lane markings there has to be perfect directions of where to go and what to do. If those are not there, one state is doing that, but the other state is not doing, then that is going to be a problem. When people from one state take their car to another state, that is not going to you know, function properly. That's where regulation comes, comes into play. All right, that's wraps up my first challenge. This is the second channel's challenge, which is connected vehicles. I have already given the definition of connected vehicles. Automated vehicles, take care of themselves. They know how to drive, what to do. It's like a single robot, and it knows how to function. Connected vehicles, on the other hand, they know how to function, but at the same time, they know how to talk with each other. So there are two things that I'm going to talk about here. First one is V2V. V2V stands for vehicle to vehicle communication. So it's going to understand what other vehicles are doing, what a similar, a brother or sister vehicle, what, what another vehicle is doing, which is also autonomous, that's going to do. So that's a V2V technologies. Uh, the, how they're going to work, they have onboard sensors. Onboard sensors, uh, they have self-driving capabilities. As you see some of the statistics, I'm not going to go through them, they're not new. Back in 2014 or so, we have had connected vehicles already. Um, you see, these are some of the examples of uh, connected vehicle uh, technology here, is that you see the rings, right? That's how they can function, meaning they have sensors which can read what is happening 50, 40 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet away from them. That's what they're studying of connected vehicles. So if you see some of the dots there, that means that is the interaction point, right? That's a network. What is a network? Human body is a network itself. We're hungry. The brain tells essentially to the stomach. Stomach, stomach tells the brain. Brain tells the mouth. Mouth tells the hand. Hey, I need food right now. That's what is a network. That's how it's functioning. It's a node. Multiple vehicles send their information. They talk with each other, make a decision, and move. That's what it is. So, going forward, uh, what do we have in terms of features? They will have a lot of features as in autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles will have all the features of automation too. So they can be connected to improve mobility, road weather, grasses information, energy information, they will have all the facility. They can talk to the infrastructure. What is the importance of talking to the infrastructure? 
right now, a transportation planner who is sitting in the office has no control of on road number X, there is a lot of vehicle. What can the planner do? Nothing. But when we, when we will have connected vehicles, the person knows that this road is extremely congested. The person will have some control. They can have, they can adjust essentially the capacity. They will tell the signal, hey, give more red time so that people wait, they will divert. Right now, we don't have any control, but with automation, we will have more control. So that's the difference of, of uh, uh, connected vehicles where it, it will have enhanced communication. In terms of application, it will have a lot of application in terms of safety, environment, mobility, smarter roadsides, weather conditions, and so forth. So how does it function? It has a lot of elements, right? There is vehicle onboard unit that is going to communicate even with mobile devices. Then it's going to collect it with, uh, with roadside units. Roadside units, uh, so I, let me give you some example. What do we mean by roadside units? Roadside unit means, you see, um, when we go over bridges, when we drive over bridges, we don't see that the bridge is just a flat road, right? On the edges of bridges, we have some raised rail bars, right? That's protect for off tracking. If you go off level of the bridge, you don't just fall down, right? You bounce back and, and come back. That's what it is. So on road surfaces, we'll have some type of sensors. Which type of sensors? Are they going to be buried beneath the pavement? Are they going to be on the side track? Are they going to be on the median? That is something that depends on the roadway geometry. So we will have those type of features um, also on the roadway. There is pedestrian detectors. Right now, a lot of pedestrian deaths. Uh, you know, pedestrian crashes are not injured. You know, pedestrian crashes are related to death. So as bicycle crashes too. If you're not wearing a helmet while going by a bicycle, imagine there is a concrete pavement. If it's a bituminous pavement, you have some safety. If it's a concrete pavement, you're dead. So that's what it is. So we see connected vehicle pilot deployment deployments. There are a lot of pilot deployments um, that, that we see on number of uh, locations. I'm going to tell you where those locations are. In terms of smart cities, uh, their deployments can be on transit. Their deployments can be on traffic signal operations. Their, their deployments can be on different type of signal priorities. Uh, so imagine you are moving on a corridor, like on a, on a road, which is a primary road, is a big road. A lot of small roads are connected, right? What do you want? All the time on the big road, there has to be green all the time, seamless movement. That's what it's going to do. Um, in terms of uh, application where they are, we see some Tampa in Florida from New York City. We see in Wyoming, uh, the truck that we see there, there's mostly coal or oil. New York City has a lot of taxi because you can drive to Manhattan there. Uh, in Tampa, Florida, a lot of tourism. So they have uh, mechanisms that they're planning to alleviate congestion and, and so forth. The third challenge I'm going to talk about is ICTs, uh, is information and communication technology. That play a heavy role. And by no means I'm an expert in ICTs. I'm just, I've just included the two for the to describe the importance of technology that smart cities play. So what is, what, is the, what is the basic element of ICT? Let's say it functions pretty well. One of the things that is a buzzword in ICT is called as cybersecurity. A lot of systems have been hacked, right? Many countries have hacked in bank systems, hacked in credit cards because it's everything is electronic. So imagine somebody hacking a traffic control center what is going to happen? It's going to be chaos. No human being is operating. All the cars and the systems are automatically driven. ICT really plays a great role. Um, and privacy. Everybody would like to have private information. Nobody would like to release their data sources. There has to be consent that would you like to release your data sets for others the way you see when you're accepting any type of terms and conditions your set. The company is asking your, your consent, or do you agree or you do not agree? So such type of privacy must be there also. In terms of security, which I just mentioned, uh, security also must be uh, there. Um, we see a timeline of uh, SCMS POC division. So what is SCMS? It is Security Credential Management System. POC stands for a proof of concept. Everything has to go through a prototype or a proof of concept before really big bunch of money is invested into some type of sectors, we would like to have a proof of concept. 
So things have begun in 2015 uh, to do what? Misbehavior detection. What is an example of a misbehavior detection? It's a crime. Um, a jail tenant, you know, a, a, a person who is in the jail, sometimes they've been, you know, uh, told to go out and clean the street because they need to do some work. They have free food um, and, and, and they're staying in the jail, so they need to do some service. However, all jail tenants are embedded with a, with a watch or in the screen, uh, in their skin itself, there is a sensor so that they can be tracked anytime, right? For some reason, they take out the sensor. So what happens? They're free. They're dangerous to the society. They need to be tracked. So smart city is not only transportation sector. In terms of privacy, what we see is that minimum crime as, as low as possible. Another example would be Twitter and Facebook. So you see a crime, you report it. Any specific keywords, as soon as they're seen in a system, in a specific area, then the police department get a buzz. They are in effect right now. So those are the things that, that we see, and we see that they have started some time back already. Uh, SCMS operations, you know, uh, this is connected vehicle support environment that we see in terms of EOC management. There are a lot of deployment sites, as you see on the right hand side, New York City, Wyoming, Michigan and Harbor. And, and, and Tampa, Florida. So a lot of cities. Now I'm into the third and uh, I'm into the fourth. I did explain about urban automation. The second one was connected vehicle environment. Third one was ICTs. This is the last segment that I'm going to talk about. Out of 12, four challenges. Here we're looking into urban deliveries and logistics. So everybody understand the needs of trucks, right? So what do we do? We are people. We need something to survive. So everything that we get, fruits, vegetables, grains, beans, anything that we need, garments, right? All of those are transported from, from somewhere. So there is a you know, quiz, simple quiz uh, that I ask sometimes students in the class. Do you know how many countries are involved to make a cup of coffee? Sometimes 11 countries are, are involved. And how many moves are involved? Sometimes about more than 30 moves, different modes, uh, different countries. So coffee or tea, they're not available in one country just like that. You know, it has to move from one place to another, a company serving, a person serving, a lot of complexities. What is Grab shows in the US, it shows that what is the movement of trade? You see the bigger, the circle, meaning they're attracting or producing more number of goods or things are transported from there. So some of the things to take care of, on the left-hand side, you see LA Long Beach there in California. On the right-hand side, you see New York, New Jersey. In the, in the right, there we see Chicago in the middle. And we see Texas and Houston in the south. So big elements. So when we have such big uh, movements offered throughout the country, how can we make individual cities smart? So we see that in terms of moors, you see that truck is the biggest moor compared to others. Among that, we see the rail being the next, and we see the waterborne being, being the next, and, and air is the least. Why air is the least? Because air cannot take bulk movements. They can only take whatever is time sensitive, temperature control sometimes, and high value goods, right? They cannot take coal or oil, for example. Intermodal movements. Things do, do not move just by one more. They're a combination of multiple boards. You see things typically go from port from, let's say, China, from China or India, things go to other countries or from other countries come to China and India, then go by intermodal facility from a water to rail, then go by truck, then go to business centers, then it reaches customers. So there's a set of complex movements here. Supply chains are often complex. What is supply chain? Meaning things going from one to other consists of multiple legs. That is what is called as supply chain. So supply chains are extremely complex and that needs to be done. On your right hand side, you see that supply chain consists of number of commodities. Commodities meaning garments is a commodity, coal is a commodity, iron is a commodity, steel is a commodity. So there are hundreds of different type of commodities happen and they have a different supply chain. We see first and last mile deliveries. You know, always the first and last mile deliveries are typically by truck. You know, somebody coming to your house to deliver a package or somebody picking up a package from your house or from a store. However, once that is done, it is by other modes. So things which are complex, for example, if you go to New York City, Manhattan, downtown of New York, people who live there, they have a lot of money, 
right? That's how they can afford to live there. So what, what they say, even though they don't have money, somebody is living in an apartment, they say that I'm living in New York City, of course I expect a lot of crowd, but give me a piece of sleep in the night. Please don't disturb me. In the night, please don't make noises. I have already worked too hard in the day. I'm going to sleep in the night. Don't make noises. Okay, that's fine. But at the same time, they say that when I wake up in the morning, I need a piece of bread right there standing on my doorstep so that I can take breakfast. How is that going to happen? <coughs> Two conflicting objectives from the same same people living in the city. They do. So what New York City has done is that, okay, that's fine. I'm okay with that, but I will tax you if you need that. Your taxes are going to be extremely high. In which way that can be done? The consolidation centers are going to be just outside of New York City, and people in the bike or bicycle are going to transport those, and those, whatever is the charge, whatever is the bicycle cost, and a person delivering that package is going to ask whatever money that person was demanded that has to pay. Then that is possible. So those are the things those are happening right now. In terms of emerging goods movement and trends, um, have you heard the concept of 3D printing? 3D printing is something that is getting a lot of attention. Specifically in many fields, I can talk about pharmaceutical company per se. When a doctor gives us a pill, they say that, hey, you need one and a half pill. I don't have one and a half pill, but you take got it and take it, right? Many times you know that, you know, if you don't got it, either you are under-consumed or you're over-consumed, right? Many times medicines are not available because ingredients are not available, right? So in those circumstances, the concept is that don't have pills actually come to you because making a pill itself is a complicated process. Have the ingredients stored like a Xerox machine. Everything is in there. You just place an order that I need this medicine and this has ingredient components. Then it will make it. Similarly, this is just one example. 3D printers have a lot of capabilities, again, in prototype phase right now. They're going to change the dynamics of supply chain. So that's another thing that is being considered in smart cities. Off-peak hour deliveries, I just mentioned uh, the example of New York City. Consolidation centers also, I mentioned, you see these smaller vehicles which are delivery, those are for cities like New York City, where people do not want any type of noises, and that's how they deliver that. Um, we see that 511 page, you know, um, I don't know the number, there should be something as emergency number has come in India, right? If you're in trouble, you can dial a number. What is that? One zero zero. So, in US, the, the number is 911 if you're in trouble. If you dial 511, that means you get traffic information wherever you are. Locally, it will give you traffic information. So, urban deliveries and logistics, essentially, good transporters can dial 511 to get information about where to go and what to do. Those information also can be updated in the 511 system. Parking is a huge problem, especially, especially what they do is. Uh, you know, there, there's a rule called as hours of service rule. Um, how we're doing with time? 35 minutes? I'm good. So um, there is something called as hours of service rule. You know, I'll give you an example of a doctor. So doctors, what they do? They go and they work essentially in hospitals. When they work in hospitals, their attention skill has to be extremely pinpointed because they are working with life and death. Right? That is why that the role is so important in, in, uh, in, in human life. Uh, so what happens in many countries, I'll give you an example of the US, a lot of people all over the world, they go to you know, pursue their uh, medical degrees in the US. So when they complete their degree, what they're called as residents. I think the same is in India also, there are residents. So when residents work, depending on the availability of other residents and doctors, Many times, patients, the way they demand healthcare needs, residents often work continuously for about 30 hours at a stretch. It's sometimes it's life and death. If they're handling a case, they cannot leave. Now, let us imagine the situation of a resident who came to hospital in hour one versus the alertness level at hour 30, where for continuously straight 30 hours, the resident has not left. What is going to happen? Do you think the alert list level is the same? No. It's the same thing. So there are regulations are in place in, 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 in medical sciences. Similarly, in truck driving, when a truck driver 
the countries are humongous. Many times you'll just see like this, why the truck is not finishing. It's like 10 axles, 12 axles, very big trucks. It's like a body of a train, sometimes with two bodies of train. So imagine a truck essentially being involved in one accident. How many human lives are involved in that? So when trucks drive, and truck driver salary, do you know how much they make? They make their salaries as good as engineers and doctors, even higher many times. Education level does not need to be that higher, but their alertness is higher too. They're behind the wheel all the time, and it's a tough job. All you are doing all day and night is just looking on the road. That's it. That's all you're doing. So when a truck driver is driving, and imagine that the truck driver is that driving continuously for about eight hours, and again, the same like a resident is dropping attention. And in the US, generally, they drive on, on highways, what they call it, meaning you know, no access, no signal, nothing. You just, you just drop into, the, into a roadway, there is no signal. It's like a drop of liquid flowing in a pipe. It's free flow, right? So once they miss a parking area, for next about 50 miles or so, which would be about 75 kilometers, there is no rest area. There's nowhere to stop. So if they're on that page for ninth hour, and this happens, or they're coming very close to 10th hour, they're danger. So truck parking is a big problem. And that has been, uh, there is a law called as Jason's law, a driver named as Jason had to die because of that. After that, rules and regulations has been extremely strict. Strict. So what we look into is two different things. One is urban parking, or there's a law, law urban parking. Urban parking is something in the downtown area, not that dangerous. Long haul parking is dangerous. So the question is that right now, we know where is a parking lot, right? We know how many spaces are there. We can easily have an information page where we can say, if you're looking for this parking lot, this many spaces are available right now so that you can plan ahead. So that's what is called as uh, like smart parking. Uh, by the way, the, the truck drivers right now in the US can drive only 10 hours at a stretch. After that, they have to rest, have to rest 12 hours at a stretch before they do any type of driving. So that's the hours of service rules. So smart truck parking, meaning at the point of time, the truck driver can essentially see from a mobile device that where can I park, where is my availability, so that they can plan ahead. That's smart truck parking. So I'm coming to the very end. I have only two more slides. This is the last but one slide. So how in the United States things have happened? The US government or US Department of Transportation has come up with a proposal solicitation that the way I'm going to move forward is that I'm going to award $50 million only to one city, only to one, not many. So who is that one city who is going to get that? And that becomes an example to the rest of the country to follow what really a smart city is. So they came up with, you see those numbers, 1,400 local officials and so forth initially participated in informational sessions. They came down to 78 applications, meaning when the proposals were submitted, 78 different cities <coughs> submitted applications that I would like to become a smart city. This is my vision. This is how I would like to become. So out of that, there are only seven cities got selected. So seven cities, they were given further funding to develop their proposal. Finally, only one city got the award, and that is Columbus, Ohio. It's in the Mid-South and a little bit, not Mid-South, it would be like Northeast uh, part of the country. You can see Columbus, Ohio would be here, right here. Here, Columbus, Ohio, here. That's, that's the city where uh, it's, it's, it's going to be made right now. So you see the, the highlighted ones are the seven who got into the second phase of it. So without further delay, what I'm going to do is that, let me see if this video has been played. I'm going to, I wanted to show you uh, the vision of uh, uh, city of Columbus, what they would like to do. If this video does not play, we don't have uh,
as well as we can have interactions for as long as you like. They don't control road weather. It transmits the road weather, meaning whatever is the roadway weather is there, they extract that information, meaning learn from the roadway weather, and then plan ahead accordingly. For example, if you have the car right now sitting in your parking lot and you want to know I would like to go from point A to point B. Let's say you, you want to right now drive from here to Kolkata, but you don't have any information what is happening on the roadway. But whatever weather conditions are, we can plan accordingly to make a set travel. That's what it does. Make sense? Good. What else? Please uh, feel free to ask questions. As I told that this is a very friendly environment. <coughs> there is nothing, no pressure, or no shyness. Okay, no questions and bad questions. What else? Yes, sir. Before going to smart city, there is a certain conditional to there. If such as Rahul Villa, first the smart city will cancel due to the renewable energy. So, in that situation, what do you do? Because in our many of the cities, uh, the conditions are not satisfied. So, they are in our state, the smart city principle is going on very slowly. So, what do you do in this area? You know, uh, everything that I talked about um, is, is mostly for US conditions, I would say. Uh, the same conditions are not at all true for India or Europe or any other country. Every country has to uh, have their own regulation, own legalization, own, own set of principles. So I will give you an example here. If you travel in the US and if you'd like to go long distance, you travel something called as interstates, where what I was talking about. As you enter into a facility, you flow like a drop of liquid flows in a pipe, no obstruction. So, can we bring exactly the same concepts to India? 15 years back, that was not the case. But the concept of golden quadrilateral has come in India recently. It's been formed. It's not completely access control. Access control, I mean by there is no perpendicular obstruction to your direction of travel. That is called as obstruction. So in access control facilities, there are no obstruction. 
So will the quadrilateral has its obstruction? Yes. At this point, yes. It's been, their attempts have been made to make it complete access control, but it's not fully functional. So there are sections of building quadrilateral where we have one lanes, two lanes. Uh, traveling on US uh, freeways, you, you feel it's an easy experience that you can go from point A to point B like you like. Many people travel just 10 hours of continuous driving, you'll not feel stressed. Some people you know, feel like enjoying uh, really driving. Can all those conditions in developed countries can be brought back to developing countries? No. So we have to have our own sets of regulations and our own set of principles. There are uh, guides that have been developed in India called smart city guides. I know some of uh, senior professors back in the US, they have been called to India as experts to form the guidelines. So everything that we saw in the presentation, some of them may be applicable to India, but not all of them. Similarly, everything in Europe or any other developed, developed countries, they're not applicable to US as well. So everybody has to have their own set of standards. Your question, coming back to your question about energy, it depends how you define energy. So, energy you define it by just only your vehicle travel, or even consumption of electricity at home, or even fossil fuels if you have to cook, or versus gasoline or electricity. What is here? That's a function of energy. So, what is energy? Energy is a combination of everything, of what type of uh, power you utilize. Uh, so what energy you really mean, it has to be you know, defined accordingly. So in India, or our television, it has to be different sets of uh, guidelines and rules in two ways. Uh, there are three states, that is, Madhya Pradesh. Britain is told that they are doing smart cities in Gopal state. So what is the difference between the Gopal state in our state? Oh, uh, sorry, Gopal is a city. So in that case, they are doing smart smart to do in here. But why they not do the well here? What the difference? Mm -hmm. What I understand from Indian ranking of smart cities that there were a lot of questions, those are asked or criteria. Based on this criteria, every question was given a score. So when all the scores are combined together, whichever cities have gotten a maximum score, they have been ranked at cities. So taking you back to the Columbus example, so Columbus received an, uh, like $50 million award to build a smart city. Does that mean that all 78 cities who have submitted application, they're going to stand since, you know, sit quiet? No, of course not. They have, you know, their share of money already been invested. So there may be some other type of concept of smart city when it will come, they'll have their share. So comparing to Bhubaneswar and Bhopal, I, I, I do not have much idea about what is going on in these two cities. Whatever assistance they will give, get from the central government, the state government will have their own share too. They will prosper, they will make all efforts to have their city prosper as much as possible. So not necessarily that one city will go ahead, other city will go back in terms of some type of funding. You know, every city will prosper. And it's of course, based on certain criteria and rules, cities get ranking, but all cities will prosper. Other questions? <laughs> All right. It does not seem that you have more questions, so we'll have the floor open for interactions. I'll be here. I'll be happy to talk with you one on one, also in groups, anything you like. Okay? So please you know, stand up, disperse. If you have to stay here, stay here. If you have other things to go, you can go. So anything you like. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you.